All right, last video, binomial problems number three. Here we go. This is an exciting video because I kind of sum everything up and I talk about something kind of new, but also something kind of easy, as long as you pay attention. All right, now, we've first talked about the binomial setting. Hopefully, everybody is set to go in the binomial setting. But the binomial setting actually has two situations. The first situation is the binomial situation, right? The one we've been talking about in all the other videos. The binomial situation is given a probability of success and a number of trials. You're looking for the number of success in those trials, right? We could summarize this very easy. We've been talking about this. If you know your probability of success P, you also know your probability of failure Q. And likewise, you are told your number of trials, right? So we could say, okay, you know, if you have 15 people and we're looking for exactly three successes, that would be um, P to the third, that'd be Q to the 12th. All right, that's the probability that you have exactly three successes out of 15. Okay, easy, easy, easy. We're done covering all that. However, we also have this other scenario called the geometric situation. A geometric situation is a very, very specific one. Kind of looks binomial, but it's really not. Here's the trick. In a geometric situation, you are given the probability of success. And all you care about is finding is the first success. That's it. You don't care about 15 trials or 20 trials. In fact, there is no number of trials in a geometric setting. In a geometric setting, all you're looking for is the probability of your first success. Once that first success happens, you don't care about anything else. Now, that means everything else leading up must have been a failure because if your first success, for example, happens on the fifth trial, that means the first one must have been a failure cue, the second one must have been a failure, the third one must have been a failure, and then finally your fourth, your fourth trial was your first success. At that point, we're done. I don't care what happens here, 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 here. That doesn't matter to me. All I cared about was that first success happened here. Everything else prior to it was a failure. So that's what we call a geometric situation. You're looking for your first success. Don't care about anything else. Okay? You still have to be independent. Your probability of success still has to stay constant, but you're not given a set number of trials. That's binomial. Geometric, all you care about is your first success. So let's look at some geometric problems so you realize how they really are actually easier than binomial. All right, the probability that a chicken gets infected with a disease is 15%. What is the probability that the first chicken infected is the fifth chicken we inspect? Now, again, this is simple. There's no fancy formula for this. There's no fancy trick on the calculator. It's just called common sense. If my first chicken that's infected is the fifth success, that means that the first one must have been a failure. The second one must have been a failure. The third one must have been a failure. The fourth one must have been a failure. And the fifth chicken was my first success. Now, remember, in this problem, success is getting the disease. Now, I know that doesn't sound very successful, but in a problem, success is simply what you're looking for, even if it doesn't sound very good. Failure would be the opposite of success, which is 0.85. For us, that's not getting infected. And again, not getting infected sounds like the good thing here, but you got to understand it all depends on what you're looking for. So in this problem, we have not infected, 0.85 not infected, 0.85, not infected, 0.85, not infected, 0.85, and the first chicken that is infected is our fifth chicken, 0.15. Now, that's it. There's no other way this can happen. I don't have to do any kind of fancy, well, how many different ways can this happen? Is this 15 choose 4 or 10 choose 2? No, there's none of that because this is the only way your fifth chicken could be the first success. Everything prior must have been a failure. So again, the only shortcut you could do would be 0.85 to the fourth because you have four straight failures times 0.15 for that success on the fifth try and you're done, 0.0783. 783. That's easy. So most kids actually think geometric is easier. All right, number two is a little bit trickier, but it's actually really easy if you think about it. What is the probability that the first chicken with the disease is found on the sixth chicken or later? Okay, so that means we want the first chicken with the disease to be on the sixth or the seventh or the eighth or the ninth or the tenth or the eleventh or the twelfth or the thirteenth. And technically, since there's no set number of trials, this would actually go on towards infinity. It could be the 23rd chicken or the 25th chicken or the 100th chicken. Again, all I know is that I want the first infected chicken to be after the sixth. Now, if you think about that, what does that mean? That means that the first chicken 
must have not been infected, which is a failure. The second chicken must have not been affected. The third chicken not affected. The fourth, fourth chicken not infected. And the fifth chicken not infected, right? Because I want the first success to happen on the sixth chicken or later. So if here's my first, here's my second, here's my third, here's my fourth, here's my fifth, that I want the first chicken infected to be somewhere after the six, right? Could be six, seventh, eighth, ninth, somewhere over here, right? So basically, to answer this question, all I have to do is 0.85 to the fifth. That's it. The rationale is actually really easy. If you want your first chicken to be infected to happen sometime on the sixth or later, then that means the first five must have been failures. That's all you care about. The first five must have all been failures, which again, failure for us is not being infected, 0.85. So the first five had to have been failures. After that, quite frankly, I don't care what happens. I don't care if the sixth one is, infe is infected or the seventh or the eighth or the ninth or the tenth. doesn't matter to me. I just care that in, for this situation to happen, the first five must be not infected. That's it. That's how easy this question is. So 0.85 raised to the fifth. Sounds almost too good to be true, but that's how easy it is. 0.4437. Okay? 0.4437. So all you got to do is just kind of think yourself through this problem in terms of what am I looking for? I want that sixth chicken or later to be the first one infected. So the first five has to not be infected. That's it. That's how easy. All right, let's do one last question to introduce one last idea. And this is really cool, and I, so I saved it till the end. All right. The owner of a battery company knows that typically 3% of batteries are defective. Consider we inspect 20 batteries. Okay, this is very, very binomial, right? The probability of success is 0 0.03. Once again, that doesn't sound very successful, but that's the probability of a defection, and a defection is what I'm looking for, and since that's what I'm looking for, I'm going to consider that a success. Q would be the probability of the opposite of that, which would be 0.97, that would be not defected. Again, I'm calling a failure not defected simply because I'm looking for defective batteries. And lastly, my sample size was told to me to be 20. So since I was given a set sample size, this is binomial. All right, now I could ask you a million questions here. Literally, I could ask you a million questions. For example, I could say, what's the probability that exactly three of them are infected? Okay, well, hopefully by now you would know I got to do 20, choose three to figure out how many different ways I could have three batteries that are defective. That would be 0.03 to the third, so three successes, 0.97 to the 17th for 17 failures or not defective batteries, and find your answer, you'd be done. I touched the shortcuts on the calculator, simple, simple, simple. Okay, but I want to talk about two last things. One key question is, one of the big questions I love to ask is this, what's the probability that at least one is defective, right? I ask this a lot. I love that phrase, at least one, defective. What's the probability that at least one is defective? Now, you need to remember, what does at least one mean? At least one means one, or two, or three, or four, or five, or six, or seven, or eight, or nine, or 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, or 20. Anything greater than one. Well, I do not feel like walking through all that. So remember, let's get rid of the opposite of at least one. The opposite of at least one is none. So if I find the probability that in 20 batteries, there are no defective of batteries. That's 0.03 to the 0, no defective. 0.97 to the 20, all 20 are working, all 20 are not defective. And if I do 1 minus that, I'll have my answer. So again, let's show you how to use the shortcut in the calculator here. I'm going to do 1 minus, I'm going to go and grab my binomial Actually, you could technically use CDF or PDF here. That's because there is nothing lower than zero. I'm going to grab a PDF, though. So 20 batteries, comma, success is 0 0.03 comma, I'm looking for zero defective, right? So now remember, the binomial PDF is going to find for me the probability that none are defective, and then the one minus will get rid of that, so I'll be left with at least one. So the probability of at least one defective battery is 0 0.4562. 0.4562. Now, remember, I said that you could also use binomial CDF here, and the reason is, is binomial CDF does the number you tell it or less, but there's nothing less than zero. So if I did a binomial CDF with a zero here as well, I would get the exact same answer. So again, make sure that you understand how easy that question is. I do like asking that phrase a lot. What's the probability of at least one? Well, at least one means one or more, so if I get rid of none, I'll have my answer. So make sure you understand why I'm doing one minus there. Very, very easy. All right. Now
now here's the last thing I want to talk about. What do I expect to happen, right? What do I expect to happen in the long run? Well, think about the probability model here. The probability model here would be 0 defective, 1 defective, 2 defective, 3 defective, 4 defective, 5 defective, dot, 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 18 defective, 19 defective, or 20 defective, right? And uh, to find the expected value in the long run, I'd have to find all of these probabilities straight down the line, and that would take a little bit of time. And then I'd have to use the idea that we talked in class. Right? This is a discrete random variable. There's only 20 different things that can happen, anywhere from 0 to 20 defective. And then I'd have to figure out the probabilities, and then I could find my expected value and standard deviation. But what I want to teach you is in a binomial situation, that is actually a lot easier to do without all of that hublub. Here's how simple it is. If I want to find the average amount defective, just think about it. I got 20 batteries. I expect 3% of them to be defective. All you have to do is multiply. It's that easy. 20 times 0.03. I don't have to do any fancy formula or any hard thing there. I expect 0.6 defective batteries out of 20. I mean, come on, common sense. 20 batteries, 3% are defective, 3% of 20, I expect 0.6. Is that how many are going to be defective? No, it could vary. So there's a standard deviation as well. And I also have a formula for the standard deviation here. Now, it's not just as simple as um, 20 times 0.03, but it's actually pretty, pretty close. It's a square root of 20 times 0.03 times failure, 0.97. It's the square root of 20 times 0.03 times 0.97. Using your calculator, that is 0.7629 batteries. Okay, so let me explain this real quick. What I'm trying to say is that these formulas are very, very simple. How do you find the mean in a binomial model? All you do is take n times p. I mean, that should be so simple. How do you figure out how many successes you expect? Well, if you have n trials and p percent of them should be, def should be um, successful, just multiply. It's that easy. The standard deviation in a binomial setting is the square root of n times p times q. So n times p is your, your uh, success rate, times q is your failure rate, and it's that easy. It's that simple. It's that unbelievably easy, okay? So let me just do one final problem with this. Let's just say that 6% of people have type A blood, okay? I don't even know if that's true. I literally just made it up. And I'm going to look at 200 people, a sample of 200 people. How many of those 200 people do I expect to be type A? Well, in the long run, after looking at many, many groups of 200, I expect 200 times 0.06, or I expect 6% of them to have type A blood. I mean, how easy is that? 200 times 0.06, I expect 12 people to have type A blood. But again, could vary, right? Could be a little bit higher, could be a little bit low. It's not always going to be 12, and that's why standard deviation comes with this. The formula for standard deviation is going to be n, which is 200, times our success rate, 0.06, times our failure rate, which would be 0.94. And once again, I'm not saying failure is you don't have type A blood. I just mean failure in the sense of it's not what we're looking for. And again, pretty easy formula. The square root of 20 times 0.06 times 0.94, I get 1.06. 1. 1.0621. So what this means is that in the long run, if you look at many, many samples of 200, not just one sample of 200, many samples of 200, you would expect an average of 12 people per group to have type A blood. 12 out of 200. I mean, how easy is that? right? 12 out of 200 six percent. But that number will deviate, and to figure out how much that number will deviate by, you get 1.0621. Again, pretty easy and pretty cool formula. It really helps us out. Now, I want to remind you why we have this formula. Remember, if I don't have this formula, if I didn't use this formula, here's how you'd get those numbers. You'd have to make a probability model saying, well, zero people could have type A blood. One, two, three, four people could have type A blood. All the way through, well, 198 or 199 or 200, right? So you'd have to find you have to make a pretty darn long list. Then you'd have to find the probabilities of each of these. For example, for four, you'd have to say 200, choose four. That'd be 0 0.06 to the four times 0 0.94 to the 196. And you'd have to do that for all of these. Then you'd have to multiply all of them together or put them all on your calculator, right? List one and list two and then run a one variable stats, L1 comma L2. And that would tell you your mean and your standard deviation. What I'm trying to convince you of is only under a binomial model, 
do you not have to do all that? All you have to do is n times p and the square root of n times p times q. Pretty easy to find mean and standard deviation when you have a binomial situation. All right, hopefully this last video has cleared things up. Hopefully you understand how easy geometric can be. Geometric, you're just looking for your first success, and that's it. You don't care about anything else. And then we also have the binomial model, and in the binomial model, it's really easy to find a mean and standard deviation. All right, hopefully you guys understand the binomial now after watching these videos. Practice the quizzes. Practice, practice, practice. We'll be ready for class.